Well, good morning, and uh, as I said, I had to be on main campus today, so I thought I would just record this lecture for you guys, and hopefully we can talk through some of the issues that you're going to see. Um, so the first part of the lecture that I wanted to do with you today is not the one with the notes, but you should have access to some images um, on screen, and so you should be able to see, uh, let's see if we can get this to work. Come on, where's my file? Move my mouse over here. Let's try that. Not working. There we go. Okay. So we're looking today and starting off uh, really getting into the cervical spine. And to understand the cervical spine, we really need to understand the anatomy and the, the movements, the biomechanics of the cervical spine. So I thought that we'd first of all uh, do this by looking at some uh, straight x-rays just to see what's going on. So with the cervical spine, we've got the body of the vertebrae as per usual for all of the vertebral um, segments. And then we've got the spinous processes, okay, these long spinous processes coming back out through here. And then these little ones here are the transverse processes. All right. So it's much easier, of course, if it comes up with uh, all the annotations already on it, but most x-rays don't actually have this. Um, but I think it's easy in this, in this image to begin to see the shape of the facet joints, the angulation of the facet joints. Because this angulation, as we're going to find out later on, actually determines the motion that's available at the facets. The other thing which is interesting whenever you look at the, uh, at the slides and look at, at the shape of the vertebrae is the position of the vertebral bodies here. The vertebral bodies are not just flat across, but they have this hollow, okay, this concavity that's here, particularly on the, the uh, inferior surface um, of the vertebrae. Um, if you look at the superior surfaces here, then they're much flatter, but then you've got this little concavity here, which gives this little pointed dip at the anterior aspect of the body of each vertebrae, uh, and that's something that we'll talk about later on. Looking from an anterior to posterior view, kind of a bit fuzzy really, isn't it? Um, pretty hard to see in some ways, um, but uh, you can just see the definition between the vertebral um, segments coming through here and so you can see where the discs are going to be and then we're looking right at the spinous processes in an end-on sort of positioning. The open mouth view, uh, there was some discussion in tutorial last week about this whenever you're trying to, to uh, get a good uh, image of C0, C1, C2 then the best way to do it is to shoot with what they call an open mouth view and it literally is that. The patient is positioned directly in front of the x-ray machine and the, the tube is aimed through the mouth so that, as you can see here, okay, this is the odontoid peg or the dens sticking up. And so if this is fractured, if there's a problem with this odontoid peg, this is the best view to be able to see this with. If you take an x-ray from the posterior aspect, then the vertebral body gets in the way. And so a lot of times with odontoid peg fractures, um, this will be uh, the view that you will see. All right, and you can also see in here all this white shininess here are fillings. So patient obviously didn't do too well with the whole teeth brushing thing. So just case in point, you're ever going to have it to get your neck x-rayed. You don't want anybody to see how many fillings you've got. All right, the oblique lateral view, not so much, a, not a straight side on view, not a, a anterior posterior, but looking laterally can sometimes give you a little bit more information. This is the view that we'll use much more in the lumbar spine to identify spondylolisthesis. But spondylolisthesis doesn't occur that commonly in the neck, and so not really a, a, a good view for us. doesn't really show us a whole lot of information. Um, and of course, the left side shows us about the same as the right side. Not a vast amount of information given. But again, you can begin to see the shape of the, of the facet joints and the position of those. You can see the foramen. Um, between each uh, vertebral segment where the spinal cord and the, and the, um, the nerve roots are going to come out of. And so again, something to be looking for on x-ray. So x-ray is pretty straightforward, pretty easy to see. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to move into the anatomy uh, of, the, uh, of the spine and move, look at the articulations of the spine uh, so that we understand what we're looking at when we get into the lab. Okay. Okay, so the uh, second half of the lecture we really want to talk about today is the articulations of the cervical spine. Um, particularly looking at the anatomy today, trying to get an understanding of just exactly what's going on with the uh, cervical spine. So that whenever we come to our 
our object evaluation on Friday and our mobilizations and stuff like that, that we really can, can understand what we're doing, how things are going to move, um, and how we can then progress. So, if we get the notes to work here, hopefully everything will all begin to kick into to place. Um, what we're going to look at today is that the cervical spine is interesting in terms of its anatomical makeup in that it's divided up into two um, distinct sections. There's the upper cervical spine um, and then there's the, oh, here we go, that's what we're looking at. So we're looking at the upper cervical spine here um, and then we have the lower cervical spine here. The upper cervical spine, C0, which is the occiput, C1 and C2. Those are considered together, and then the lower is C3 down through to C7. And so that's what we're looking at. Now, being PTs, of course, if somebody had to include and make a name for themselves and throw in another um, section, so we have three sections according to some authors, and of course that is the junction between the upper and the lower section, which is right in through here. But let's just consider it in terms of upper and then lower. All right, so we had a quick look at the x-rays earlier on, and just to get ourselves familiarized, here we are, okay, looking at the bodies of the vertebrae, looking at the spinous processes of the vertebrae, the transverse processes of the vertebrae coming in through here, C1, C2, right the way down through to C7 and T1. Remember, there's, there are C8 that we're going to come to when it comes to dermatomes and myotomes, but there's no C8 vertebral uh, body itself. So it's C7 and then T1. Okay, if we just had the, the diagrammatic form of this, then this is what we're kind of looking at, just to give us an idea, so we have a better understanding. And I remember the top up in here, C1, C2, we're going to talk about this junction in particular, and how it is created with this special little peg of bone uh, called the odontoid peg. Um, and so really, this upper cervical region here is very specialized, provides for um, specialist movements. The rest of the cervical, C3 right the way down through to T1, um, much more uniform style of vertebrae and have a, a much more uniform um, style of motion and it goes with them. Okay, so what we're looking at, the vertebral bodies. Vertebral bodies are a little wider transversely as compared to the uh, anterior posterior direction. So a little wider across than they are front to back. And they are much smaller than either the thoracic or the lumbar. Now, if you think about that logically, okay, if you, if you had lumbar vertebrae up in your neck, there wouldn't be a whole lot of motion. It'd be very stable, but you wouldn't get a lot of movement coming out of, of the neck, and so it wouldn't really be that effective. Having said that, like the rest of the vertebral bodies and the vertebral structure, the cervical spine does act as a load-bearing um, structure, carries the weight of the head on it, and also carries the weight of the head out in space. Um, if you think about your head as it's just sort of teetering on top of, of C1, C2, uh, it's held in place by ligamentous structures and by muscle attachments. And so it's kind of balancing up there quite precariously. Um, so there has to be the strength of the cervical spine to be able to hold and uh, hold stably the head in place. So looking at the lower cervical spine, okay, this kind of uniform standardized uh, sort of uh, shape of the the vertebrae themselves um, right down here where's my little there we are there's my cursor okay right down in here is the body of the vertebrae and in the in the on the body of the vertebrae we have our attachment location for the intervertebral disc we then have our transverse processes out to the side and we have a hole here or a space here and this is different from the lumbar and the thoracic because it doesn't exist down there, and this is the transverse foramen. The transverse foramen on either side is where the vertebral artery passes. And so when we do our vertebral artery tests, and Marwan's going to talk to you about those on Friday, we talked about that a little bit in tutorial, uh, but when we do those vertebral artery tests, what we're going to find is that the motion of the, ver of the vertebrae relative one to another puts tension on the vertebral artery as it passes through this little foramen. The big foramen at the back, triangular shaped foramen here is for the spinal cord. And then we have our set joints, right side and left sided. So as you can see here, the, the transverse processes seem to have these two projections and it's a little valley in between. And this is where our nerve roots sit. And so as our nerve roots come down from the spinal cord, they then run down uh, 
just right beside the um, transverse foramen, right beside the vertebral artery, and then out of the neck and down into the body. The other thing which is a little different in the neck uh, as opposed to the thoracic or the lumbar region is that the spinous processes sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes have these little uh, bifid tips they're called. Where instead of having one bony uh, prominence, there's actually two. And you can palpate these. And I'm sure in a bunch of the class on Friday when we get you guys down on the beds, we'll look at these and we'll actually see, yep, there they are, and you can feel two bony sort of lumps. Now, what happens a lot of times with these bifid tips is that the a therapist will come in and they'll palpate one of them and they'll think that, it's, that that is the whole spinous process. And so if this was the whole spinous process, then they would think that the vertebrae has actually been rotated. But the vertebrae hasn't been rotated, they just need to drop their fingers over to the other side to feel the whole uh, spinous process. And so that can sometimes be a little confusing. People can be doing their palpations, going down through the, the uh, joints of the neck, and they hit this by the tip, and suddenly they think, oh, we've got a rotated vertebrae. Well, you don't, okay? The other special little process that uh, you'll see on the, the bottom, if you go back to the, the image yourself on your own um, slides, you'll see where it says U, that's the unciform process. And the unciform processes are only found in the cervical spine, and they're particularly found on the superior posterior lateral rim of the vertebral bodies, and they consist of a ridge of bone that runs anterior to posterior. So on either side of the spinous processes, or the, the vertebral bodies, you've got this narrow ridge of bone uh, that runs, and it creates this nice sort of reservoir and valley for the intervertebral disc to sit uh, in, right in there, being protected on either side by that ridge of bone. That ridge of bone is called the unciform process. So it takes that flat planar surface and turns it into that concavity that you see. So this is a little different because not all of the, uh, the, the lumbar vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae do not have this. So with the, the cervical, uh, you've got to remember that on the lateral side, uh, you've got these unciform processes. So consequently then, if you look at the inferior aspect of the vertebra, uh, vertebral body above, it's kind of reciprocally shaped. So they sit in this nice sort of U shape and they will fall nice and naturally into each other. Now if you think about the, this position, if you think about this shape, you've got this ridge of bone on either side, which means that if the disc is in the middle, it's not going to be able to move laterally. So in the lumbar vertebrae, when we talked about disc uh, protrusions, and we talked about disc injuries, we talked about posterior, posterior lateral, and occasionally lateral. Well, in the cervical vertebrae, because of the unciform processes, lateral protrusions are very uncommon. You're not gonna see them, probably not gonna see them at all. Now, the articulation of the unciform process, okay, from the vertebrae above and the, uh, the vertebrae below, is known as the uncovertebral joints, or much more sexy name is the joints of Lushka. And so you'll see these, uh, these two names that are given to these joints, and basically it's the attachment or the connection point of the ridge of bone uh, of the vertebrae below to the vertebrae above. They're not really true synovial joints. They don't have a true synovial capsule. They don't have true synovial fluid in them, um, but they are joints nonetheless. Now the other thing that's a little bit more interesting about the uh, vertebral bodies of the uh, cervical spine is that the anterior rim of the vertebral bodies actually will, will project downwards. And so we have these unciform processes that run along the sides that hold the disc in place, and then the, the underside of the vertebral bodies will project downwards, um, and it protects the disc in front. So when you think about this, you've got your disc sitting on top of the vertebral body, You've got the unciform processes beside it, and then you've got this anterior projection protecting it in front. So pretty much the disc is held uh, and secured on top of the vertebral bodies uh, in the cervical spine like no other part of the spine. This downward projection uh, and the unciform process then provide pretty much a, a complete encasement of the inter intervertebral disc except for posterior. So in the disc, or in the cervical spine, when you have a disc issue, you end up more commonly with posterior 
and occasionally posterior lateral disc protrusions. But posterior ones are much more common. Now these unciform uh, processes are, are not actually present at birth. Um, for those of you who have uh, got nieces and nephews or your own kids if you've got children, um, when you look at their heads, their heads are all floppy. Their heads are, are they have no stability, they have no strength, and they also don't have the, these unciform processes there to provide that additional stability. So roughly between six and nine years of age, they begin to grow. And as these unciform processes begin to grow, then the head and the neck becomes a lot more stable. So little kids okay, don't have that strength, don't have that stability, and uh, need to be a little bit more protected. The unciform processes themselves actually mature by the age of 18. And so for you guys, you all have mature unciform processes. Um, so at least there's something uh, that you've got that's matured. The initial uh, degeneration that occurs in the cervical spine typically occurs at these joints. So the joints of Lushka are the first location for degeneration. But if you can, if you think about the position, think about where they are, they're, they're running right alongside the bodies, and so there's always contact from the vertebrae above to the vertebrae below, and even though the facet joints are going to slide over each other, you still have these joints of Lushka that are constantly being worn down through time. And so degeneration occurs, it's the first place that it happens. The other important thing to remember about the unciform processes is that the very shape of them, their positioning and the shape of them actually will decrease the amount of lateral flexion that's available. So the amount of lateral motion that you've got, the amount of lateral flexion that you have, is actually uh, minimized by these joints of Lushka. And consequently, whenever we actually start to go into lateral flexion, there's an element of rotation that occurs. And so as you try to side flex your, your head uh, and your neck, then you begin to rotate so that you get an increase in range of motion. But to stay in true side flexion, there's actually not a lot of motion available. As I said before, because of the position of these, because of the shape of the, the vertebrae, a straight lateral uh, disc bulge is very unlikely. Um, uh, compression of lateral neural components, very unlikely. Uh, if it does occur, then something seriously, uh, something majorly wrong has occurred. And so you've got to just be, be mindful of that. When your patient comes in to present and they present with uh, particular signs and symptoms, we're not often thinking about a lateral bulge, but we are going to think about posterior and posterior lateral corner type bulges. When we look at the neck and we look at the motions that are available and we look at flexion extension, then you've got to think about the shearing that takes place uh, during flexion extension on these joints. The, the amount of, of stress and wear and tear that occurs, if you just think about today, and uh, when you got out of bed, how, how many times from the time you woke up, you got out of bed, have you moved your head in a flexion extension position? How much pressure have you put on these unciform uh, processes just today? Just in the process of getting up, getting dressed, getting to, to college, sitting through class, and now listening to this lecture. Moving on to the lateral aspect uh, of the, the vertebral bodies, we've got the pedicles. And the pedicles um, project pusher laterally from the vertebral bodies. They're a little bit, a little bit different uh, in the in the cervical spine as compared to the uh, lumbar and the thoracic. And because of the shape of them, uh, and the, the angle at which they project off of the vertebral body actually then alters and changes the uh, the shape of the spinal canal. So. In the cervical spine, the spinal canal is pretty large, and it's also more of a triangular shape than a circular shape. By the time you get down into the lumbar uh, region, then you've got more of a circular shape. It's not quite as large, but if you think about it, it's coming, the, the spinal cord coming straight off the, the brain, straight off the brain stem, coming right down through, you need to have the space. If you think about the amount of motion that your head has to go through, well, if you had a very small spinal uh, canal, then you'd put a lot of compression on the spinal cord way high up in the neck. 
which would cause symptoms right the way down through uh, potentially into the arms and potentially into the legs. The anterior wall of the spinal canal, as you can see from the, the picture of the vertebrae, is relatively straight. Um, and so from one vertebrae to the next, it's just a, a flat surface. And then you've got the anterior longitudinal ligament coming in there to connect those, uh, and those flat surfaces together. And so we have this pretty much triangular positioning of the spinal canal. Moving out laterally, like I talked about whenever the picture was up, you've got the transverse processes. And the transverse processes are not just one, one bone, but it's actually the anterior uh, transverse process and the posterior transverse process. And there's this tiny little strut of bone that connects the two of those. And where that strut of bone connects the two, it creates that transverse foramen. Now the whole thing is the transverse process, the anterior and posterior strut, okay, that, the whole thing is the, the transverse process, not just one or the other. And we don't ever refer to it as the anterior transverse process or the posterior, it's just the transverse process, but that's how it's designed and that's how it's made. And as I said, that, that little space in between is the uh, transverse foramen, and running right down through the transverse foramen, of course, is the vertebral artery. And again, talked about that on, on Friday, Marwan's going to uh, take you through the objective evaluation uh, of the, the uh, cervical spine. We're going to talk then about the vertebral artery test that I know we talked about in tutorial last week. So these transverse processes then, we've got this anterior strut here and this posterior strut here, and then you've got this foramen in the middle. As I said before, there's this little sort of channel and valley, and that's where the spinal cord, spinal co uh, is going to then throw off its um, nerve roots, and those nerve roots are going to run down through here and, and lie in this little channel and then out into the body. The vertebral disc is going to attach up here on the body, and then of course these two little flat surfaces are not Mickey Mouse ears, they're actually your facet joints, um, and those are going to be articulations we're going to talk about in a minute or two. So there's the nerve root, as if by magic, we just added it into the picture. And with these nerve roots, okay, you can see the positioning here, how close it is to the facet joint. So facet joints being synovial joints with a capsule, if we end up with pain and discomfort at the synovial joints because of swelling, then we can end up with compression of the nerve root. And you remember in your anatomy, um, class whenever you were drawing out your diagrams and you, you had all the, the branches and everything, well you get one or two slips that come off of the nerve roots. And so this is the way that it looks. Now compression of this region is going to provide discomfort or symptoms through each of the branches of this nerve root. Same fashion, here's the, the uh, body of the vertebrae, and so the disc, posterior lateral bulge of the disc is going to come in somewhere down through here. That's going to then put compression on the nerve root. Again, going to have symptoms going the whole way down the course of the nerve root. The spinous processes themselves, um, in the lower cervical region, the spinous processes are pretty short, and most of them have bifid tips. And the reason that they have bifid tips is that as the, the neck goes into extension, then you've got the bifid tip and the spinous process above is going to come and just get an increase in the range of motion because it can slot into that bifid tip. And so that's the, the, the reason of having that split in the tip of the spinous process. As you work your way down through the cervical spine, then the spinous process is typically increase in length. Um, between the third uh, cervical spine and then the, th the second thoracic. So forget one and two, we're talking lower cervical regions. So C3, four, five, six, seven, uh, down into T1 and two, the spinous processes gradually increase in length. Um, but by the time you get into C6, C7, the bifurcation has pretty much ceased and uh, it's only a single tip by the time you get into T1, T2. One issue that can occur just because of the, the shape of the bones is that if the, the spinous processes are too long, then the amount of extension that's available will be compromised because those spinous processes will impact one another and they'll, they'll bang into each other as you take the neck back into full extension. And so 
as your patients come in and we look at their available range of motion, sometimes when you get the x-rays, you want to just look and see, do they have excessively long spinous processes? Have they always had a decrease in that uh, range of extension? And something you want to check with them as you're going through your evaluation process. The apophyseal joints or the zygopophyseal joints or the facet joints um, are uh, joints either side of the cervical spine. So each vertebrae in the lower cervical spine has got two superior articular processes and two inferior articular processes. And they reciprocate with uh, the vertebrae above and the vertebrae below. And it's the artic these articular facets that when we look at the, at the cervical spine, and this is what we'll be palpating on Friday, they actually create what's known as the articular pillar. So the facet joints, as they sit one on top of the other, right the way down through from, from C3 down into T1, they create a pillar on either side, which is where those, that, uh, the movement of flexion extension, the slip and slide between the two uh, articular facets occurs. So when we look at, um, well, we'll come to a little picture after this one. When you look at the, the shape of the, uh, the facets, the angle of inclination or the angle that the facets are, are uh, held at is roughly 45 degrees to the frontal plane, with the superior facets facing posteriorly and superiorly or back and up, and then of course the inferior facets face the opposite direction and they face anteriorly or forwards and they face downwards. And these two then sit on top of each other. So we're in this position. We have our, our uh, superior facets which face posteriorly um, and superiorly, sorry, and then our inferior facets. So the superior ones from the vertebrae below, inferior one from the vertebrae above, and they sit on top of each other at this roughly 45 degree angle. They are uh, synovial joints, so they have a joint capsule. They're synovial joints, so they have uh, synovial fluid. They are synovial joints, so they react in exactly the same way as every other synovial joint. So whenever they are impacted, they will swell. Okay, and so we've got to remember that. We have to be mindful of that whenever we're dealing with these with our patients. So as you can see here, so we have our, our superior facet up here facing posteriorly and upwards, our inferior facet facing anteriorly and downwards. And you can see the angulation of these as we move down through the cervical spine, which helps to produce the movement that is necessary um, for us to have full flexion and full extension. Okay, and um, we're back. Um, take a break, finish yesterday's, uh, or the first half of the lecture yesterday afternoon in my other office, now down on main campus. New day when uh, Tuesday morning, change of shirt, change of color. Uh, I've got to talk about movement patterns um, this time, so I'm uh, just going to keep on trucking along through here the, through the, the lecture. So let's get our mouse working. There we go. So when it comes to the cervical spine, when it comes to the uh, movements of the cervical spine, we're going to treat it in both the upper cervical and the uh, lower cervical. <clears throat> so we have to think about those two areas um, slightly differently because they do move a little bit differently. And the reason that they move differently is because of the shape of the bones, the shape of the facets, um, and uh, just the, the design, the lack of, of discs uh, in between C0, C1, C1, C2, um, all add to altered biomechanics. So when it comes to flexion extension, Okay, the movement uh, from the occiput to C2 um, typically occurs as an entire unit. All right, so between uh, C0, C1 is where a lot of the flexion extension occurs, C1, C2, not so much, but then C2 on C3, C3 on C4, C4 on C5, etc., right the way down through, um, so that, that you get that movement together at the top half and then individual motions. Uh, as you move down through the, the cervical spine. During flexion, um, there's an anterior translation of the vertebrae that occurs. So as we think about the facet joints, as you move forward into flexion, there's an anterior translation and slide of the vertebrae up and over the one below it. And consequently, when you go into extension, then you get that posterior translation, that slide posteriorly of the facet joints, one on top of the other. Now the total translation is roughly 
between two and three millimeters. So we're not talking about a huge amount of motion here, um, but for each, if you then add on each subsequent amount of translation uh, down through the vertebrae, then over the total uh, length of the neck and the cervical spine, it's a considerable amount of movement. When it comes to lateral flexion and rotation, below the level of C2, rotation and lateral flexion occur at the same time. So below uh, C2, so C3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, um, whenever you have lateral flexion, you have rotation at the same time. They're not separate at all. And so as you try and do it, I can see you're all trying to do this. If you try and do this, then you end up with this element of rotation that occurs. And that is purely because of the positioning and the shape of the facet joints. So rotation lateral flexion occurs in an ipsilateral or a same direction. Okay, so the cervical spine is flexed to the left. The spinous process rotates to the left. So if we go to the left, okay, the spinous process goes to the left. Now your nose goes to the right, but that's left rotation because you have to think about the rotation in terms of where the spinous process is. So the spinous process sitting out the back, as it rotates, okay, you get that nose goes to the right, but the spinous process goes to the left. So you side flex to the left, spinous process goes to the left, your nose goes to the right. So get those two uh, straight in your head. As I said before, it's all due to the all due to the uh, plane of the facets. Don't you just love computers when Skype's unresponsive? Awesome. Well, you know this is live, and uh, I'm not going to go back and re-record it because I don't really have time. So let's look at the upper cervical spine. Let's look at the bones that are in there. Um, we're dealing with the occipital atlanto uh, joints, the atlanto axial uh, joints, or C0, C1, C1, C2. So the atlas, number one, the first cervical vertebrae. Uh, why is it called the atlas? Yep, mythology. Who was atlas? He was the guy that stood with the world on his shoulders. So your first uh, cervical vertebrae sits with your head on, a, on its shoulders. So that's why it's called the atlas. The atlas itself has got no vertebral body. And so the vertebral body, where, or the, the space where the vertebral body should be, is actually um, just an, an opening. So it's a, a ring of bone and not what we normally think of with the body and then the, the transverse processes and the spinous processes. So, oh, great. Okay, here we go. I wonder if I can flip that. So looking at the upper cervical spine, we're going to be dealing with the occipital atlantal uh, joint and then the atlantoaxial joint. So C0, C1, C1, C2. Um, that's what we're going to be dealing with. The first bone, C1, is called the atlas. The reason it's called the atlas is that uh, in mythology, atlas uh, is supposed to have been the strongest of the gods, was able to stand with the whole world on his shoulders. Um, and so the first cervical vertebrae sits uh, right at the top of the, of the neck with the whole of the head on its shoulders. Therefore, that's where it got the name from. One thing that is interesting about the atlas is it doesn't have a vertebral body. Um, it's actually, the vertebral body is just a space. So the atlas is more of a ring of bone. And the space where the vertebral body should be is actually where the odontoid peg sits up inside. Okay, so the, the dens or the odontoid process from C2 projects upwards into the space where the body of C1 should be. But because it's not there, then we have this different sort of mechanism of uh, vertebrae from C1, C2 as compared to all the others. So C1 technically is kind of like a washer that sits on top of a peg uh, between the occiput and the axis. When it comes to bony regions, it doesn't have a body. Okay, What it actually has is an anterior arch, lateral masses, and a posterior arch. So front, back, and two sides. Uh, but they're known as the anterior arch, the lateral masses, and the posterior arch. So when we look at it in picture, okay, we've got the anterior arch, We've got the posterior arch, where the body of the vertebrae should be in this position right here is where the odontoid peg sits. And so that odontoid peg sits right up in here, tight against this bone. It's then held together tightly by ligaments to keep it intact, to keep stability between C1 and C2. And then on the lateral masses or the sides where the transverse processes would be, we have our transverse foramen, but we also have these large, large facet positions um, where the head articulates on top of the atlas.
the uh, inside of the of the right and the left anterior arch there's two tiny little bony tubercles okay and those bony tubercles are the attachment of the ligament i was just telling you about the transverse ligament uh, which is part of a, a cruciate ligament or a cruciform or a cross-shaped ligament uh, complex in the neck that cross-shaped ligament complex is there to hold the odontoid peg tightly in contact okay so c1 and c2 are held tightly in place um, to make sure that there's stability but also that odontoid peg that sits on top of the, the ring allows for rotation. Now if that odontoid peg were able to shift, okay, and slide, then what would happen is that, that if it wasn't attached to the, to the superior arch or the anterior arch, um, sorry, it would shift posteriorly and it would impact the spinal cord and you would get symptoms then the whole way down through uh, the spinal cord into the arms and into the legs. That odontoid peg, that's the, the uh, little piece of bone that is fractured. Um, whenever there's a, 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 what's called an internal decapitation or a, a fracture of the, uh, the, the dens of the odontoid peg, the fracture itself is not what's fatal, it's the fact that the little piece of bone is so close then to the, um, to the spinal cord that it could just then embed itself into the, the uh, spinal cord right up high up into the brain stem and that's what causes death. So the second cervical vertebrae is the axis, sitting right on top of the atlas. And the axis, as the name suggests, is where a lot of rotation occurs. And it's basically a pivot point. It's a pivot point on which the occiput and the atlas rotate. And they rotate around that odontoid peg, which is just sitting up um, on top of where its body should be. So the dens or the odontoid peg is, is sitting right on top of the superior aspect of the vertebral body so it does have a body but it's not the flat sort of typical body it's got this little uh, upward projection that we've already said articulates with the anterior arch of the atlas the transverse ligament and the apical ligament um, are the two ligaments that form that cross shape so the transverse coming across to hold it in, and then the apical ligament forming that cross uh, attaches to the uh, tip of the dens and from the tip of the dens up to the occiput so the dens is held in place, okay, right tight against the anterior arch by the transverse ligament, and then it's held up to the occiput through the apical ligament. So these, these ligaments, the alar and apical ligaments, <coughs> or the transverse and the apical ligaments, uh, are seen here. Okay, so the dens, the projection of the dens coming up through here from C2, this bone, C1, the spinous process or the, the posterior arch has been cut here so you can see this and then the, the, the posterior aspect of the occiput has been trimmed as well in this, in this image. So you can see here that um, you've got the transverse ligament coming across holding the dens tight against C1, apical ligament holding uh, the tip of the dens tight up towards uh, the occiput or C0. So it's designed to be stable, it's not designed to move. If you think about the position of that and you go back to Dr. Diener's lectures on neuroanatomy and, and the position of the brain stem, the dens is right there sitting right uh, beside the brain stem. And as I said, fracture dislocation of the dens is, can be fatal. And it's not the fracture that's the problem, it's the fact that you can then have that, that dens, that is on toy peg, that is uh, shot or driven up into the brain stem. Now because of that, because of the potential fatality of, of a fracture in that location or that injury, then we've got to be careful about diseases that would weaken those ligaments. One of the primary diseases that, that will attack and weaken those ligaments is rheumatoid arthritis. And so a, a number of our patients with rheumatoid arthritis are going to end up with, with neck pain and neck problems and we need to be able to check for stability of the dens to ensure that the dens is, is still located where it, sh it should be and also to see how much play or how much movement there is um, between the dens and C1. And so on Friday when we get into our object of examination uh, lecture and our, our lab session, um, our one's going to talk to you about uh, testing that and we're going to check that out. And that's, uh, that's a, a two very important tests that we need to be confident with and competent with. I, I did have a patient one time who um, reported to, the, to her doctor, she, she was a, a retired nurse, she was the sole caregiver of her, her, um, her husband who was wheelchair bound. 
And this lady reported to her doctor that she had pain in her neck. What happened was she fell out of bed, she rolled out of bed, time to get up to, to get her husband up out of bed. And she, she rolled it, but as she rolled, she fell and she hit her head on the nightstand or the, the little uh, set of drawers beside her bed. And she had this incredible pain in her neck. And she thought, well, I've got to get him up and, and to the bathroom and get dressed and everything. But the pain in her neck was just, was just excruciating. So she took some painkillers and got her husband up, got him dressed. And pain in her neck didn't cease, didn't re relent at all. Um, <clears throat> and so she eventually called the doctor. Called the doctor, doctor uh, brought her in, had a look at her. She explained where the pain was. He, he was a little uh, concerned, so he sent her off for an x-ray. Um, later that morning, she arrived up into the hospital uh, where I was working at the time. She arrived in, had an x-ray that morning, and she had fractured her odontoid peg. She had no neurological uh, symptoms at all, but the fall, whatever way she had fallen and hit her head, she had actually fractured the odontoid peg. It wasn't impinging on her spinal cord or her brain stem at all, and so all she had was just the excruciating pain of the fracture. And, uh, and that poor lady ended up in a, a halo brace um, for the next uh, two and a half months. Um, after having uh, surgery to, to have the, the dens um, sort of re repositioned so that fracture healing could occur. So not every fracture of the dens is fatal, but most of them, they actually are. When we look at the upper uh, cervical joints, <clears throat> there's a lot of synovial joints um, present uh, in the midst of all of this. Uh, you know, if you think about the neck and how, you know, it's, it's not the biggest amount of space but you've got you know, at least two synovial joints um, on top of each vertebrae and then two below, because you've got the facets okay, that face upwards and the facets that face uh, downwards. So it's a lot of, of synovial joints, which means a lot of joint capsules, means a lot of synovial membranes, means a lot of potential locations for swelling. Now we just had Batman getting into a car uh, crash last week and ending up with some whiplash. So if you think now about these synovial joints and the number of them that can potentially be damaged, then you can see how uh, whiplash injuries and neck injuries like that can be so uh, so painful and, and so sort of detrimental to people. You think about the, the, uh, all the joints, you've got the joints between the condyles and the occiput, between the lateral masses of the atlas and the axis, the dens and the anterior arch, okay? Bunch of synovial uh, joints, no intervertebral discs. You will never have a C1 disc problem if it doesn't exist. No disc between C1 and C2, no disc between C0 and C1. Your first disc is C2, C3. Always remember that. Now when it comes to flexion, extension, and movements at these joints, okay, some schools of thought will, will say, and I don't know what Julie had taught you last year or Sky had taught you in anatomy, that, um, that flexion occurs at, at uh, one level and rotation occurs at the other level. Actually, what's true is that you get a little bit of both at both. Okay, but with flexion and extension, C0, C1, and C2, C1, C2 are involved, but C0, C1 is a little bit more flexion extension than C1, C2. When it comes to rotation, both levels are involved, but C1, C2 has a little bit more rotation than C0, C1. So that's why it's kind of commonly thought of Zero one is the nodding joint, and one two is the shaking your head joint. But you got to remember that there's mo movement occurs at both. So somewhere around 45 degrees of flexion extension takes place. About 25 degrees of that takes place between C0 and C1. About 20 degrees between C1 and C2. As I say, when it comes to rotation, it's a little bit of rotation that, that occurs at C0, C1. It's not none. There is a small amount. Um, but most of it, about 40 degrees of rotation, occurs at C1, C2. So about 60% of all the rotation that occurs in the neck occurs at this region. So for a patient to get full rotation of the neck, okay, 60% of that movement comes from uh, C0, C1, C1, C2. And of that, the majority from C1, C2. So we have a patient that comes in whose neck is stiff, okay, they've lost the ability to rotate, then we've got to be starting to think about um, how much loss has occurred at the 1-2 level. They may have symptoms further down, but if the symptoms further down have caused then stiffness further up, then we might need to treat not just the symptomatic uh, area down maybe 3, 4, 4, 5, 
but we also have to go back up and check one and two and just to make sure that the rotation is there. All right, a couple of things for you guys to, to look at and to review. Um, and I don't don't spend hours on this, okay? Just just kind of make sure that you know where everything is. Where there's not a test on it, it's not a quiz. Um, I want you to just refresh your memories on the location of, of the following ligaments: so the ligamentum nuci, supraspinous ligament, uh, ligamentum flavum, posterior atlanto occipital ligament, lateral occipital axial membrane, and then the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. Just so we know what the the restraints are to movement in the neck. So we start to do our flexion, extension, our rotation, side bending tests, so we understand what is supposed to be restricting those, those motions. So have a quick look at those. Hopefully that's only a couple of pages in your anatomy notes. And then the muscles that we're going to have to, to be aware of. Um, of course, you've got trapezius, so digging down through that into stenophytomastoid. Your rhomboids, your levators, uh, your paravertebral uh, fascia, your splenius muscles, and then into the little tiny ones semispinalis, the longissimus, your suboccipital muscles, and then your scalenes. Again, it's not a matter of knowing precise origin insertion, it's a matter of knowing location of where these muscles are, uh, the action that these muscles have. So that we talk about our spinal cases, if our patients have lost a particular motion, then what muscles are involved in that, and how can we get that movement back. And then the last few muscles, the longissimus, uh, coli, your capitis muscles, then rectus capitis, anterior lateralis, and then your infrahyoid and your suprahyoid muscles. So I know that that's probably the, like the last week of your anatomy notes, so your brains were probably fried by that stage and you can barely remember the names of them. But if you can dig out those notes, just have a quick look just to refresh yourself so we know where everything is uh, in the neck. Then when we come together on Friday, Marwan's gonna talk about the object of evaluation and the object of exam. Um, and then on Friday in, in our lab sessions, we're going to get in and we're going to actually do some of the, the movement tests and all of those things and start working on the neck. All right. So thank you guys for, for putting up with this, uh, this video style presentation today. Um, let's say sorry I couldn't be in class with you live today, uh, but I hope that this has been helpful. All right. Talk to you later.